Today we're going to talk about a kind of an unpopular subject, and that's the subject of hell, eternal punishment. And because of an English translation in the Bible, uh, the word hell means a lot of words. It's translated uh, into hell from Sheol, from Hades, from uh, the lake of fire. And it even includes segments like uh, Tartarus and Paradise and Abraham's bosom. But I want to talk about some of the views of hell that are current today. And just for clarification, that's what this is about. We don't want anybody to go there. As a matter of fact, Christ died so that we wouldn't have to. Now, when we're looking at different views of hell, there's some basic questions that need to be asked. One, does the presentation of what anyone is saying or writing about hell, does it diminish the threat of God's judgment? Okay, does the teaching being presented to you actually soften the urgency of repentance, which God requires? Uh, Is this offering something that goes beyond this life, that you don't have to make a decision now, you can put it off. Modern views of hell allow one to feel a little more comfortable and complacent by making God appear not quite so severe. Challenges to the doctrine of hell start by questioning what the Bible clearly says, but they don't end there. The trend to make hell appear more bearable and tolerable, it follows a tragic pattern. And that pattern is the moving away from a commitment to the Bible as the absolute truth, campaigning against hell's eternality and severity. Now, let me give you a few ideas that come right from Jesus' lips. Not Paul, not the apostle, not any expositor. This is Jesus himself who said, Fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He also said from his lips, depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the, da- er, uh, for the devil and his angels. Now he said in Matthew 8, 12, that there would be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And he talks about a spiritual and a bodily destruction in Matthew chapter 10. In uh, Matthew 13, he regards it as a fiery furnace. In Matthew 22, Jesus is talking about it being in outer darkness. In Mark 9, it's an unquenchable fire. In Luke 16, it's endless torments. Well, Jesus used these pictures and metaphors to help us understand uh, the horror of hell. Darkness represents loneliness, insecurity, uh, the sense of being lost and disoriented. Fire represents the excruciating pain of burning. And a lake of fire, which was John's description, represents the sense of drowning or suffocating, taking the burning sulfur internally. All right, so as the fire burns from, uh, it, it burns forever from the outside in, he also talked about a worm, which doesn't die and it devours eternally from the inside out. So these are some very vivid pictures that Jesus is painting here of hell. It should be repulsive and frightening actually to any person. And no one can come away with the idea that hell is a tolerable place even to spend one minute, let alone eternity. All right, let's look at scripture in Revelation 20, 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Mark 9, 43 says, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Now that's pretty serious. It's better for you to go into life maimed than having two hands and go into hell where the fire is that it is never quenched and the worm does not die. And uh, so that means like how important is it to miss hell? If you're there, you would have traded anything in life not to have been there. Now, let's look at a, uh, a story. I, uh, I almost said a parable. It's not a parable. This is in uh, Luke chapter 16 from 19 to 31. We have a story of a, a, a certain rich man. And the scripture said he was clothed in purple and fine linen. He fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Okay, so this is not a parable. He's naming a certain person, a certain rich man, a certain beggar. These, he even has names, Lazarus. Well, Lazarus was uh, laid at his gate at the rich man's gate. He was full of sores and he desired to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. The scripture says, moreover, the dogs came and uh, licked his sores, speaking of Lazarus, the sores. And it came to pass that as the beggar died, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died also and was buried and in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments. Okay, notice right away, hell, 
torment, okay? And he seen Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me. Send Lazarus that he might just dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So here's Lazarus, here Abraham says, Son, remember thou that in thy lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he's comforted and you are tormented. And beside all this, there's between us and you, there's a great gulf fix so that they which would pass from hence to you, they cannot, and neither can they pass to us. So there's a separation now. And uh, then he said, I pray thee, or the rich man in torments, speaking to Abraham, he says, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, um, If they won't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And this man had complete memory. He had recall and uh, he couldn't get out. There was a separation, a gulf separating. This is eternal punishment, and it is not a new concept, okay? Whether you're in talking about Plato's Facilium uh, or Tataris and the Aztecs Mictlan, there's always, for every culture, religion, and race, there's been a place of moral consequence in the afterlife. This is not new. Reward and payback has existed in the, in the minds of men for ages and ages. Like I said, everybody recognizes justice and injustice, except atheism. Uh, they all contemplate a place of recompense after death. That's because the universe is moral and man is made in God's image. Now, despite the many arguments to the contrary, everyone understands good guys and bad guys, okay? To deny this with a relativistic argument uh, that's simply to dodge intellectual honesty, okay? You need to get out more. But the heavens and earth, they declare his glory, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. This is Psalm 18. And uh, if you've ever looked at the heavens, if you've ever looked through a Hubble telescope, or the photographs, I mean, um, it's amazing. It's overwhelming, the creation of God. And this is just his physical work. He and say, hey, there is a creator, Okay, that's very, very logical and simple. As a matter of fact, to deny it is, according to Nietzsche, or Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, he said it's untenable to deny the existence of God. Well, God can be known, his power can be known. The scripture has said, for God has showed it uh, to all people. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So whoever did this is pretty big, okay? So that they, or immoral men, they don't have an excuse. No one has an excuse. Well, let's move on to Hebrews 6.2. And there's a verse there written by the author, who I believe is Paul. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the faith towards God in the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. Well, in this video, God's permitting. Eternal judgment implies, one, that uh, there is no appeals court, okay? After the great white throne judgment, God's assessment stands. His sentencing irrevocable and eternal. There's no probation from hell. There's no early release for good behavior. Uh, in fact, well, good behavior won't even be possible, okay? The damned are broken and dysfunctional. They're without love. They're without hope. There's no godly desire or godly de uh, design. You only exist in a place where you're exposed to hate, shame, anguish, contempt, and these fuel the fires. And so they, by choice, have become God's enemies. Now, for this discussion of eternal punishment, we're going to consult only the Bible. This is important, okay, because the Bible is the ultimate authority and source of all Christian faith and practice. People will give you all kinds of extracurricular arguments and documentation and personal experience. This is uh, existential support, and, uh, but we're going to say 
Okay, fine, but the true litmus test is going to be the Bible. Please, what book, what chapter, what verse? Whatever your argument is going to be presented, please support it with sola escritura. Okay, so numerous forms of persuasion uh, are offered by opponents, or opponents, people against eternal judgment. But let the truth be found in the scripture, okay? So let's keep this as, this is our standard. This is what we're, well, but, no buts, please. Chapter and verse for any argument against this. Eternal punishment is meted out in a lake of fire, according to scripture. Now, Romans, in the first chapter, it said, for God's, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So it's not a popular topic, like I say, and many people simply refuse to have this conversation. They want to deny and reject all aspects of justice, judgment, uh, equity, inequity, retribution, um, except when it's about somebody else. When somebody else does us wrong, we always want him to pay that so-and-so, I hope he burns in hell. Well, uh, you're going to be painted with the same brush. I'm sorry. Obviously, no one complains about going to heaven, but there's a lot of people complaining about hell, and obviously it's because it's eternally unpleasant. So let's talk about some of the oppositions um, against eternal punishment. One of them is just majorly plain old sentimentalism. Uh, it's not logical, and it's without rationale. Many people simply are repelled by the concept of unpleasantness. So they deny it. They say, I just don't, I don't want to go there. I won't have this conversation. It's ugly and uncomfortable for me, so therefore it doesn't exist. Well, this is really a denial. If you've lived any time in life, uh, you know that it doesn't match up with reality. Okay, there are many unpleasant experiences in life. That's just the way it is. And for all the subjective burying your head in the sand and saying, uh, no, I don't want to discuss it, reality doesn't disappear. It's there. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on sentimentalism, but it's, it's a very big cause of why people reject the idea of eternal punishment. Second thing is, is some people come up with like a, like a psychological or a sociological argument. They say, well, fear is unhealthy. Okay, fear is not good. People don't operate under fear. Um, eternal punishment is considered bad. It incapacitates people. It, it's, just, it's just not good. Well, I want you to know to the contrary, fear is wonderful. Fear is a necessary and important and a useful function of character. It can preserve your life, believe me. Uh, it can avoid a lot of treacherous incidents if you're if you use that caution, that fear, especially the fear of the Lord. And this is a reverence which will keep you from sin. But let me clarify, honestly, objectively, on the other hand, a phobia or an obsession, which isn't necessarily predicated upon an accurate, accurate assessment of fear. Yeah, these are unwarranted and in excess. It's, uh, well, in excess, they're called pathos. Okay, so this is not a useful fear. It's disruptive, it's unnecessary, it's an inhibition that we really, you know, can do without. So now, it's either because of uh, intentional proclivities or just poor understanding of the English language, uh, not all fears are pathological phobias. Okay, fear is sociologically very healthy, especially when it's used as a deterrent. Okay, a deterrent. Fear is a good deterrent. And punishment, um, which brings me to this uh, argument. In the society today, to be politically correct, they say, well, punishment has to be rehabilitative or it's not real punishment. Well, baloney. Our prisons do not rehabilitate anybody. They come out, you know, just look at the records. The uh, statistics are contrary to the idea that punishment is rehabilitative. Oh, I won't do it again. It just doesn't bear out, okay? What you're probably thinking of is chastisement. Now, chastisement is correctional. It's advantageous. People who are parents know this, okay? But society is misnomered and redefined punishment according to its own political correctness. It's true. Hell serves no rehabilitative function. Um, however, the threat of going there does. The, the threat of punishment was intended by Jesus as a very severe deterrent. 
Okay, if your hand offend you, uh, it's better. If your eye offend you, it's better. If anything in this world um, is going to be um, a motivation to send you to hell, get rid of it, okay? And you might not like being maimed in this life or being halt or crippled, but in hell, you will wish that you had plucked your eye out or cut your arm off instead of going to hell. In other words, what is it worth to save a soul? Well, you couldn't exchange everything in the world for it. That's, you know, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? Now, so I reject the idea of, uh, of uh, well, it, it's a punishment. It's not rehabilitative, so God can't do it. Let's just dismiss it and say it's not valid. Another thing is they say um, that it's too long of a punishment for such a short crime. Eternal punishment is not commensurate to temporal or limited life of sin. If I live 50, 60, 80, 100 years old, why should I pay a penalty for all eternity for all the sins I committed in just, you know, 90 years or whatever my lifespan is? Well, this implies that the wages of sin has a quantitative value which is bigger or surpasses the quantitative punishment, okay? And therefore, God is unjust to send anybody to hell. Well, first of all, we just made ourselves the judge of God where we did this, and that's pretty ridiculous. And uh, we, have a, 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 we have assessed or put a value upon sin according to our understanding of it. However, the Bible, which is what we're going back to, it teaches that eternal punishment is appropriate for sin. The soul that sinneth it shall die. So the opinion of man is not the opinion of God, and man's assessment of sin is definitely not God's assessment of sin. Well, another argument brought up about, uh, about eternal punishment is, well, this would mean that God failed. Okay, if hell and the lake of fire are real and eternal, then uh, God failed in his endeavor to make all things good. Well, that was never the argument to begin with, so this is a false premise. And also, another false premise is the eternal existence of evil, which means that the devil and his angels are being uh, punished punitively for all eternity, it, so they still exist, that this uh, indicts God's ability to get it right, uh, that God failed. Well, <laughs> there's a big false premise. One which I just mentioned, that makes us the judge of God. But the second is that um, we automatically assume that evil negates or cancels out good, that if evil exists, then there can't be any good. But good is not a comparative noun or an adjective. Uh, only God is good. Somebody came to Jesus, called him good master. He said, well, hold it right there. Only God is good. Now, something might be better than something else by someone's assessment or comparison. This is an arbitrary exercise of free will and choosing to qualify the difference between one thing and another. The existence of free will, let me really emphasize this. The existence of free will allows for both evil and righteous acts. And the individual is accountable, not God. Uh, just the fact that God gave men a free will to do evil if they choose, it doesn't mean that God has failed and it doesn't mean that God is evil. Now, if you're looking for a scapegoat, if you want to blame someone for the poor exercise of free will, then you need to look at Adam. It rests with him, by whom sin entered into the world and the human race. Uh, it's not God's fault. If you want to throw mud, you better throw it on Adam. Okay, the free will which God gave him uh, is how this got here. The failure is not God's, it's Adam's failure. So remember that the next time that we're looking up to the heavens, shaking our fist or yelling at God, complaining, God, this is not fair. God, why? Why did you do this, God? God didn't do it. We live in a fallen race. The sin entered into the human race by one man's sin, and that's Adam. So the only alternative to this whole scenario is no free will at all. Well, if that were the case, we wouldn't be having this discussion, period. You know, there, there wouldn't be any character. There wouldn't be personality, period. Another argument which they claim is theological against hell is that God is love. Well, this argument, um, this viewpoint, simply, which simply says that God is love, means we have a definition problem as well as an application problem. 
Okay, God is love. He's not a sentimental, wavering, slobbering old man who just lets everything go and refuses to uh, be just. And to the contrary, uh, God having judgment and God being a judge, it's actually enhanced by love, okay? Just judgment is a prerequisite for something called mercy. And God could never be merciful. Mercy would have no value if there were no judgment, if there was no justice. You wouldn't be forgiven of anything. You'd simply say, well, nothing ever really matters anyway, so fooey on mercy, who cares? Well, James in 2.13, he says, for he shall have judgment without mercy uh, upon him that showed no mercy. And then he says, mercy rejoices against judgment. So that's what God would actually choose is mercy, but he has to be just and a judge in order for mercy to have value. Now, those who reject God's mercy, well, they simply default to his justice. That's it. C.S. Lewis uh, so aptly wrote, hell is locked from the inside. Okay, people are not in hell because God did not choose to love them, but rather because they chose not to love God. It's that simple. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, um, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And we also know that in Matthew, in the 11th chapter, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. So if we reject hell and eternal punishment, the question automatically presents itself, what, what do we replace it with? I mean, unless you're going to say that justice doesn't matter, injustice is, is nothing, on moral, what do you replace hell with? Well, here's some of the things that are commonly said. Uh, you make your own hell right here on earth. I'm sure you've heard it, so have I. Okay, they say, well, it's the consequences of your own decision during this life that makes your hell here on earth. But let me point out some very obvious reasons that that can't be true and that does not work. This is not axiom, as they say in mathematics, because many, many innocent people suffer from things they never did. Some people were victims. Some people suffered collateral damage. It wasn't their fault. They didn't initiate it. They didn't sow it, but they're reaping. Everything's hitting the fan going all over them. There are innocent people that suffer, and there are, and the other side of this is, is just as obvious. There are people in life who do horrible things, and they don't suffer at all. Okay, they're, they're living it up. They have done horrendous acts, and it looks like, oh my gosh, this person is going to get struck by lightning, but he doesn't. Nothing ever happens. So to say that you we're making our own hell on earth by the consequences of our decisions, the truth is it doesn't bear out in reality. Keep reality in mind. Trust me, God gave us reality to keep our doctrine and belief straight. Reality is a wonderful thing even though it comes on as like, oh, I hate this. Okay, but reality is necessary. Another um, thing that people want to replace hell with is called universalism. And a lot of people are shying away from that name because Jehovah Witnesses and, and Mormons and uh, other cults are very much involved in universalism. Um, they, and basically uh, what it means is this. It means that everyone eventually is going to be saved. That's what's going to happen, okay? The existence of hell or punishment isn't really denied uh, that it exists, but the existence of eternal hell and punishment is existed, okay? Simply stated, it's like this. The impenitent or sinners, whatever you want to call them, us, like, like I lived my life before I met Christ, uh, the impenitent, su impenitent suffering um, in hell will eventually repent and ask for forgiveness. There's no deadline, there's no time limit in which one can be saved, so all people are going to eventually be saved. Well, to answer this, in Matthew 12, 33, uh, Jesus is very clear that whosoever, whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So that's from the lips of the Savior. So that means, oops, one got away. There will be people in the next world in hell and punishment 
after this heaven and earth are passed away and, there's, and after the other side of the great white throne judgment, that they're not getting forgiveness. So there is a verbal example from Jesus of some people that just, no, they're not coming out of hell. Another thing is seen with Lazarus and the rich man. You can see that the crossing from one side to the other, it was impossible um, at that time of Hades. And if you want to follow a, a short eschatology in our argument, let me say this, that Luke 16, 26, Abraham responds to the rich man, um, the rich man's request for Lazarus to come and drop with, with a drop of water on his finger. And uh, he said, besides this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fix so that they, which would pass from over there or from here to, to you can't, and they who were over there can't pass over to our side, okay? It is impossible. There has been, and at that time that Jesus spoke that story, there was an impassable separation between Hades and the bosom of Abraham, or, uh, well, later Jesus actually calls it paradise when he's talking to the thief on his cross, on the cross, but we'll go there in just a bit. So remember Christ had not risen from the dead, okay, so... Hades is still compartmentalized. Hades is simply Sheol. It's Greek. One word Sheol is Hebrew. The other Hades is, is Greek. We don't have this differentiation in English, and I'm, sorry we, we, and I'm sorry we don't. But we see that Christ descended into paradise. He told the thief on the cross, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Okay, after his crucifixion and the death, um, we also see that uh, there were Many people who were liberated uh, in this Abraham's bosom or paradise, and they were brought up. These are people who had died in the faith. These were people who were looking forward to his coming. Well, why were they in Sheol? Why were they in Hades? Because quite honestly, the penalty had not been paid. Calvary had not happened yet. But after Calvary, these people were... They say, oh my gosh, he's here. He's paid the bill. The one, you know, Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand on the earth at the latter day. That's the oldest book in the Bible, by the way. Um, and so Job knew that Jesus was coming. So let me mention that those who, who, those who died in the faith, okay, um, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, uh, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Wow. You mean the Bible's telling me that by faith they didn't get it? Yes. Why? Because God having provided something, some better thing for us on this side of Calvary, that they without us should not be made perfect. What that simply means is that Abraham was liberated at Calvary and Dave Skinner was liberated at Calvary. Calvary is the point. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the liberation of all of us. Does Abraham look forward? I look back. Okay, now upon Christ's resurrection, uh, he brought the faithful waiting saints with him when he came up. <clears throat> and they were actually seen, seen walking the streets of Jerusalem. In Matthew 27, verses 52 and 53, it says the graves, which means the sepulchers or the monuments where their cadavers or bodies were laid, and the graves were open. And many of the bodies of the saints which slept, which is Christian talk for were dead, but they slept, they arose, <clears throat> and uh, they came out of their graves after the resurrection, and they went into the holy city, and they appeared unto many. So this was a fulfillment that when Christ ascended, he brought them out of that uh, category, or that uh, separation of Hades or Sheol, and, uh, but he was leading captivity captive. This is also mentioned in Ephesians in the fourth uh, chapter in verses 8 and 10. It says, wherefore he saith when he ascended on high, he led captivity uh, captive, he gave gifts unto men. If you look at the original text of that in the Old Testament, the prophecy regarding that, he received these gifts himself, but then Christ shed them or donned them upon the church. All right, now he that ascended, which is Christ, uh, it's also him that descended into the lower parts of the earth. The same Jesus, okay? He that descended into the, he that descended uh, into the same is also him that ascended up far above all the heavens that he might fulfill 
all things. So later, Christ's ascension led to the gifts being given to the church. We know he told the disciples to wait um, until they were endued with power, go wait back in Jerusalem. We know the story of the upper, upper room, Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, then the Holy Spirit came, and uh, it was given upon the unbeliever, or the... <laughs> Excuse me, it was given, but it was shown to the unbelievers, but it was given to the believers that were waiting in the corporal body of Christ. The ecclesia was in full function from then on. We see the reports, the whole book of Acts records the primitive or the new church and all the uh, uh, missionary endeavors that it did. And there's, there's nothing, however, in the scripture anywhere that suggests or that the apostles suggested in their preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that you don't have to make your choice now. There's no po post-mortem or after-death salvation even suggested anywhere in scripture. As a matter of fact, to the contrary, if you look at the story in Luke in the 16th chapter, Abraham was saying to the uh, rich man in hell who was in torment, he said, look, during your lifetime, you got good things, Abraham or uh, Lazarus got bad things, and now you're getting the bad things and he's getting the good things, okay? And besides that, I can't change this situation because there's a great gulf fixed between us. Well, that gulf is even more fixed now. Back then, they couldn't pass from there to there and those from there couldn't get back to the other side. There was no intercambio, inter-exchange, okay? And now even less, well, then it was permanent. Now it's still permanent. It's always been permanent. It always will be permanent. Okay, but Jesus has ascended. He's taken those people out. And the only thing that hell has done is enlarged itself, okay? More people who have chosen to go there can go there. Ultimate reconciliation is not consistent. Proverbs 29, 1, the scripture says, He that being offeneth reproved um, and hardeneth his neck shall be suddenly destroyed, and that without remedy. An additional obstacle to universalism's idea of then God failed, so he's got to redeem his reputation. <clears throat> Excuse me. It also comes down to the angels. Uh, what about them? They're creations of God. In ultimate reconciliation, the devil has to get saved too. And uh, the, we're finding out that we have a really misconception, a really warped idea. This point demonstrates that there's a severe confusion between forgiveness and loss of functionality. Many people, when dealing with conceptual degrees of punishment, they consider sin like it's a crime, it's a misdemeanor, or I wasn't doing 100 miles an hour in a 25 zone, I was only doing 35 miles an hour in a, in a, in a 25 zone. <clears throat> but they don't realize that it mechanically causes moral dysfunction. It makes you dysfunctional. If an object is altered and can no longer perform its function for which it was designed, it is forever useless. If you choose, if you pull all the teeth out of your comb, well, it can't comb your hair any longer. Its function, it has been altered to become dysfunctional. Enter the concept of hell, Gehenna. The Valley of Hinnom was a garbage dump at this time that Jesus used, <clears throat> excuse me, to draw this imagery from that the fire isn't quenched, the worm dies not. Because in garbage dumps, they have worms and they have fire. Uh, if you magnetize your computer's hard drive, well, guess what? You're not going to be able to print your report out because you have destroyed the function of it. You've gone in there and you've destroyed it. It's no longer functional. Can you wish you hadn't done it all day long? Can you get it back? No. It is destroyed. It is now dysfunctional and hell is full of dysfunctional people they can no longer and they they can no longer correct or rehabilitate themselves or even god to the point where their lives live were lived for honor and glory of god satan has corrupted himself he's not just a liar <clears throat> excuse me, but he's the father of lies. He knowingly and willingly made the choice to exalt himself above the throne of God, above God. Satan is blasphemed the Holy Spirit continuously. He is morally dysfunctional. He cannot be rehabilitated. So lastly, universalism also believes that um, in believing that enough time in hell will eventually convince all the people to 
repent and accept Christ as Savior and then receive the forgiveness of sins, uh, they'll be transferred from eternal, or they don't say eternal, they'll be transferred from punishment uh, into heaven. May it suffice to end this argument that saying coerced, forced, free will is not free will at all, okay, period. Jeremiah eight twenty: the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Over, over and out, done with. Now, I want to move on to another idea called annihilation. And annihilationalism sim simply believes, simply believes that, for instance, in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that perish simply means be annihilated or come into extinction. The unrighteous become extinct or annihilated at death. Listen, please. Extinction is no punishment at all. And therefore, justice or injustice is completely ignored. It's missed. All right, now there are those people who are annihilationalists who believe that there is a conditional immortality or the, antith or the antithesis of it, a conditional morale or mortality. They say that um, basically they don't deny hell, but they simply say that you live long enough or you exist long enough to pay for your sins in hell and then, poof, you're annihilated. You cease to exist. Well, once again, this is an argument or a perspective predicated on well, too much punishment for too small of a crime. That we can't. That the punishment that we will pay for the punitive uh, in in hell is going to reach a certain degree where okay, time's up. You're you can all come out. Well, the idea of justice is respected and honored, but they don't understand the depths of sin. Now, the Bible says that eternal punishment is appropriate for sin. So I'd like to bring a couple things to your attention that we don't think about sin. And, and I know this is not going to be an adequate illustration of sin because it's just one that one that's just made up. But don't forget, um, millions of men have lied, have, have laid dying on battlefield soldiers, uh, since time began have been bleeding and dying and have died indeed never to see home, family, or loved ones again. It's a horrible thing. The horrors of war are incredible. This was brought about by one man's sin. Hospital beds all over the world are filled with people who are terminal and they're gasping for air. They're getting their last breath and they die, shattering the hopes and the hearts of family that are with them and loved ones. It was one man's sin that brought us here, okay? There have been rape victims and sexually abused women and molested children, and they're left numb and desecrated by the lust of another. It, they're eternally traumatized, scarred for their entire lives. Well, this was brought on by one man's sin. Divorce, it rages through marriages and shatters the, the, the hopes and hearts of children forever. It destroys their outlook on life. It's one man's sin that brought this to pass. You know, as the, the sting of, of finding a husband or a wife in sexual relation with someone else, it's, it, it's incredible hurt, damage, rejection, and the rage of jealousy, which the Bible says cannot be bought off. It consumes years of one's life. This was the product of one man's sin. Grieving families have to deal with suicide. They lament despondently over a, an incredible loss. They're stunned. They never know if they're going to recover. This was brought about by one man's sin. Some people have worked and labored and toiled their whole lives, given blood, sweat, and tears, uh, not just for their own security, but hoping to leave a treasure for their children, for their grandchildren, and Poof, it disappeared in one night through somebody else's immoral act of wantonness or greed, lust for gain. Well, all that came about by one man's sin. Every drug addict and slave to his vice, every uh, one who destroys not only himself, but those people around him, fulfilling the desires of his heart and mind, it was one man's sin that opened this door. Every 
prostitute that is found dead and murdered, every firing squad that kills people for ethnic cleansing. It all got here by one man's sin. And we assume that, of course, you know that I'm talking about the sin of Adam. So, but we assume that the sin of Adam was worse than our sin and that our sin is is not making perpetual waves, that our sin does not have any consequences for our children, for future generations, that somehow our sin is not very severe like Adam's sin. Uh, we think that our sin is insignificant. We don't see sin like God sees sin. Those who believe in annihilation simply believe that sin is not that big of a deal. Sin is not that big of an issue. We don't see it correctly. Well, then enters the uh, etymological insanity, the word wars. The, well, this translation says that, and this is an error, and this Greek is uh, not parsed correctly, and there's misapplied hermeneutics, and the plethora of, of, uh, plethora of fallacies in logic that enter into this realm, this uh, chaos of persuading. Okay, well, let's hit it. Okay, I'd like to bring up some of the rules for the discussion, for the argument here, which we've already covered before. One is that the Bible is the source and the standard of faith and practice. I don't care about all the other people that are confirming or not confirming scriptural evidence. Give me scriptural evidence for your argument and I will take it. I will say, I agree. I see it. I understand it. <clears throat> Two, let's not use logical fallacies, at least unwillingly, all right? But let's not use the fallacies of logic to try to trick and deceive sleight of hand. Certain logistical fallacies are used as arguments, um, <clears throat> and we need to be aware of that. Their, their design is to persuade us from the common salvation that was once delivered unto the saints so that we could believe something else. Uh, let me name just a few of the arguments. One of them is an equivocation fallacy. And these are formal terms, but they're correct, and you need to be on, on the lookout for them. This is when words are used multiple times with different meanings. And this obviously exists in a lot of translation. Hell, like I mentioned, hell is translated in English as Gehenna, as Hades, as Sheol, as a uh, place of the lake of fire, um, uh, hell is used as hell in Greek a lot of uh, and if you play and bounce the words around that's why for this discussion I've simply said <clears throat> let's use the original word okay so that there's no ambiguity Tartarus is another one that Peter talked about the angels being chained or reserved under chains of darkness all right Abraham's bosom we've defined these things and we've talked about even paradise uh, Jesus said to the man this day shalt thou be with me in paradise so let's be cautious and not use ambiguity to favor or advance our argument against objectional and I mean objective truth is what I mean Another argument or fallacy is a straw man fallacy. It's an intentional misrepresentation in order to make your argument look weak. Okay, this is basically saying, look at my right hand, but don't look at my left. Okay, because I got five fingers here and I've got something different going on with my uh, other hand. Let's talk about this. No, if that's not the argument, then that's not the argument. Let's not switch it or divert our attention in a straw man argument. This is bringing a different topic with the hopes that the listeners won't even notice the sleight of hand. There are other arguments from ignorance. This is often used. All right, this assumes that a uh, claim is true because it can't be proven false or vice versa. I can tell you there are Martians on Mars and you say, no, that's not true. I say, well, prove otherwise. Okay, you can't prove it. There's not the information or the data to substantiate that my statement is false or my premise is false, although it's a false premise. Okay, and then there's a genetic fallacy, the acceptance or rejection of a concept based on the source opposed to its merit. Okay, if Frank says two and two is four, and Sally says two and two is four, you say, I like Frank, but I don't like Sally, so two and two is not four because Sally said it. It's sort of like guilt by association, okay? You could say, well, Hitler liked dogs, therefore dogs are bad. It's not good. It, your argument is not objective, okay? It's based on um, ignorance. 
an argument from silence, for instance, uh, is where a conclusion is based on the absence of evidence rather than the existence of evidence. Okay, so with those concepts in mind that I, I want to beware of those tactics, let's look at two of the verses that are challenged by annihilationalist, okay, regarding the phrase forever and ever. We see it in Revelations 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. Okay, they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And then again, we have another reference in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. It says, and the devil uh, that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast where the beast and the false prophet are, and and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we're trying to run away from the idea of forever and ever because we don't want to accept eternal punishment. The idea of forever and ever is presumed by a lot of annihilationalists to be a temporary thing. Um, it's in... Uh, it's a limited time or an age or an eon, which is a limited time and age. The argument simply states that the Greek word ionos means an age, which is a limited time. So it's based on an understanding from the Greek. However, there are a lot of idioms used in scripture. And so let's look at the same Greek phrase forever and ever. And I want you to know that it is used consistently throughout scripture, referring to the attributes of God, who is obviously not for a limited time. Okay, it's as if we were to say in 1 Timothy 1, 17, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory for a limited time only. Amen. Well, no, it says forever and ever. Amen. And that's exactly how it should be read. It is an eternal attribute. It's like saying, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, not forever, but for thy speaking of the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for a limited time only. Amen. See, this is inconsistent. You can't define a word, and in this case, um, ionos, you can't take that word eternity in some places and say, well, in other places I'm going to use the concept that it's only an age and that age upon age means a limited time upon a limited time, therefore eternity, uh, eternal punishment is not true. This is begging the question, and exegetically, it's dishonest, okay? If you're doing an exegesis, there are rules of grammar that must, this is not only a straw man fallacy, it's a formal fallacy as well. And again in Matthew in 10.28, uh, where Jesus says, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, God, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Uh, they target the word destroy, which in Greek is, is um, apolemi, A-P-O-L-L-Y-M-I. And, uh, and they say it has the possible interpretation of not just destroy, but to annihilate. This is simply not true. The Greek word for annihilation is apans, A-F-A-N-S-I, or I-S-M. It is, it's a different work. It's not apolemi, it's apanism. And you cannot say, well, I want it to mean this word in this place, and I want it to mean this. We are not at liberty, okay? We are not at liberty to change what God said. You can disagree with it. You can reject it. You can argue against it. You say, I don't like it, but you're not at liberty to change what God said. There is a Greek word for annihilation, and it is not the word destroy. Another tactic of persuasion um, is to associate the claim that someone makes with somebody else who they don't like and undesirable, okay? This is what we just discussed, a genetic fallacy or guilt by association. This tactic rejects the claim because the person proposing the claim, um, they might be associated with someone else that the hearer doesn't like, okay? In this case, let's get right down to brass tacks, eternal punishment, it's the Roman Catholic Church. People say, well, the Roman Catholic Church, I dislike it, I disagree with so many things, fine. 
but uh, they hold the traditional view of eternal punishment. And even though they found it useful in controlling the lives and finances of millions of people who are uh, easily duped or religiously oriented people, and we know that the Roman Catholic Church was not led by godly Christian men, but by bloodthirsty, power-hungry megalomaniacs who slaughtered millions of people for their own personal agenda, just the fact that they quoted the Bible does not make the Bible wrong. It, it, they used it when it was convenient to advance their causes. This does not invalidate the Bible. The Bible is not therefore bad because they are bad and they used it. The eternality of the human soul can also be seen in both the Old Testament and the New. Look at Daniel 12, 2, and many of those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. You can't get around that language in Hebrew. John 5, 29, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. It would be very difficult to exegese that Daniel's everlasting contempt was different than the resurrection of damnation that Jesus was speaking of. They're the exact same thing. Okay, so a few last points. Additionally, in Revelation 20, 10, it says that the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are, um, or where the beast, with the beast and the false prophets, and uh, the smoke of their torment shall ascend up forever and ever. Um, the annihilational, annihilationalist uh, say that this can't be correct because there's no day or night there. We're speaking of a time after the great, great white throne judgment. Heaven and earth have fled away. God's there. The judgment has happened. And the people, whosoever was written, who, whosoever was not, whosoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, they say, well, there is no day or night. So therefore, this cannot be true. Okay, uh, but this is an idiomatic expression, okay? Yeah, there's no sun, there's no moon, but the reference, which is clearly idiomatic, it means forever and ever. Look at Isaiah at 66, the very last two verses in the book of Isaiah. It says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, that's time. From one Sabbath to another, that's time shall all flesh come to worship before me, all nations. Well, that's timeless. So the term used from day to night is an idiomatic expression. It means forever, thus saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. This is a testimony and a witness. Okay, God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. It's a metaphor. It's a euphorism. The bodies are falling apart. This is a horrible end of those people. This is written during the time um, talking about the future of the return from Babylon. There are people who are going to rejoice in being brought out of captivity, and there are people who are going to, in short, if I can switch back to the wilderness, they're going to be cut off through unbelief. They're going to be those people who live horrible, who are going to die in the wilderness. On this, this scenario is a picture of a battleground with slayed bodies, with dead bodies laying on it. The worms are eating them. Obviously, at cleanup time, they come to throw them into the fire, uh, the funeral of the uh, fire to burn these bodies, but yet they or fall apart because the worms have destroyed the inside, the integrity of them. This is really, but this is, this is not only apocalyptic speech, it's true. And some people say, well, the bodies are not there now, so this cannot be eternal. It's an idiom. Believe me, you don't want to go to hell. It's obviously speaking about the disobedient Jews returning from the Babylonian exile, and they were completely destroyed. And here in the 21st century, just because you can't see um, a body being consumed by worms, well, it's idiomatic expression. So please recognize also this. They say, well, that's for the devil and his angels, which is another argument. No, the beast and the false prophet are people. They are real flesh and blood people, and they are feeling the heat for all eternity, okay? So not only the devil and his angels, but the rebellious, impenitent 
human beings. They're in eternal torment. So we're going to recap. Mark 9, 43 through 48, Jesus said, And if your hand offend you, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than to have two hands and go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. He also said, If your foot offend you, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life halt than having two feet and to be cast into hell with the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If your eye offend you, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and to be cast into hell fire, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched.